الآن يمكنكم المشاركة في مبادرة الأيام الرقمية تحت شعار انطلق بقوة مع جوجل والتي يتناول فيها خبراء جوجل عناوين جديدة أسبوعيا مثل السحابيات مهارات من جوجل أندرويد فلتر ذكاء الآلة فاير بيس ديزاين ثينكينج مقسمة إلى دورات وورشات عمل يومية بالإضافة إلى مسابقات أسبوعية شاهد الأيام الرقمية مباشرة على اليوتيوب وشارك رأيك وأسئلتك مع خبراء جوجل واحصل على شهادة حضور في كل محاضرة تشترك فيها هذا وأكثر من الأحد إلى الخميس ابتداء من الساعة التاسعة بتوقيت دبي عبر الرابط المبين youtube.com slash gdg Assalamu alaikum, good evening everybody, good afternoon, maybe good morning, depending on uh, what, uh, what, uh, what, what, what region of the world you, you're in. Uh, welcome to today's sessions of the MENA Digital Days. My name is Nabil, I'm a director of training Google Cloud with a company called Jellyfish in, here in, uh, in Dubai. Uh, I'm also a Cloud GDE uh, in the UAE, so, uh, so today we're going to talk about uh, an interesting topic, a uh, very important topic in, uh, in Google Cloud. Scaling on demand. So, uh, so let's see how Google Cloud will help us to uh, to scale when we need uh, when we need more resources to uh, for, for whatever reason. We've got the, we're going to have a look at as well at uh, why do we need to scale? What are our uh, kind of use cases? Uh, is is it just because we, uh, we we need more resources, or is there any other areas where or any uh, use cases or situations? Where we need to scale, other than uh, our uh, our environment, where we need to, to to have our applications that we are using and our service that we use. So let's get started. So in particular, we're going to talk about um, uh, VM instances. So uh, this is the first thing that comes to mind when we talk about uh, looking at for more resources to uh, to scale. Uh, so we, we cover VM instances as uh, as it is the service in GCP, which is infrastructure as a service. And then we will look at all the services that are available for us uh, from Google, where where scaling is uh, is managed for us and um, and is basically taken taken care of uh, for us. So we uh, we will see how 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 that uh, that works and what are the services that are um, have the uh, uh, the scaling capability. Uh, natively uh, uh, designed into into them. So, what we're going to talk first: the VM instances, uh, how and why they should scale. What are the uh, the, the options that we we can scale uh, VMs, uh, which are compute engine instances, as the uh, the term that we use in uh, in Google Cloud. So let's see let's see how um, how this came along. Uh, and how do we need scaling and how basically uh, start to, to have a, like a recap on what VM instances are and how, how did we get to virtualization to, to start with. So uh, not very long ago, the, the default way to, uh, to basically deploy an application um, uh, in our systems uh, was on a physical physical computer or a physical server. So to set one up, you would uh, you would need to find the physical space. You would need to find uh, power. You would need to, to provision cooling, network connectivity for for that uh, physical server, and then you would need to install an operating system. Uh, then you need to install any software dependencies, and then finally, before you get to the application, before all that, uh, obviously you need to uh, to purchase that server. You need to go through the um, uh, the processes, the internal processes for whatever company you're working for, so the finance team, the approval, uh, the purchase order. So it, it, it takes takes a long time before you get to uh, to the level when you install your application. Now, if you need more processing power, redundancy, security or scalability, uh, you, you're going to need to add more of those services uh, as you hit that uh, kind of threshold or you need more resources. So, so it, it, at the time, and even some companies, they still in the uh, in that case, it was very common for each computer to to be uh, used for a single purpose. So you will hire uh, uh, them all days. You have an email server specific for for dealing with emails, database server, web server, uh, content content delivery server, for example. And this practice basically wasted a lot of resources, and it took a long time to to deploy, maintain, and scale. And uh, it, it wasn't really very, very portable neither. So applications were basically built for um, a specific operating system. 
and sometimes specific hardware we've seen some uh, kind of uh, uh, legacy applications and specific applications that you need a, a particular hardware that you need to run them on then came along the virtualization that you can see on the uh, on the on the right side of that slide um it helped us by making uh, making it possible to run multiple uh, servers uh, on the same hardware multiple virtual servers and uh, and different operating systems uh, on the same physical hardware uh, and that is by the uh, the means of a hypervisor. So the hypervisor is the software layer, basically that breaks those dependencies of the operating system on the underlying hardware. And and this basically allows us to to create those virtual machines to uh, that, that they share the, uh, the hardware and they're completely independent of each other uh, in terms of uh, the resources they are using. Obviously, uh, the resources of the host they would be shared. Uh, and this is uh, something like KVM is is uh, a very well known hypervisor that is used today, or uh, uh, VMware, or there, there are a few out there. And today you can use virtualization to to basically deploy uh, service very very quickly. So so this virtualization means that it takes us less less time to to uh, to deploy new applications, to deploy new solutions. And we are now in the business of wasting less resources of the physical computer, the hardware. That. So we, we don't have like one hardware specific for one application. So this allows us to uh, abstract that, to have an abstraction where we can have a uh, multi-purpose uh, ecosystem or uh, in, into, into the same hardware. And we get some improved possibility because uh, now virtual machines, they can be imaged, they can be moved around to uh, from one host to another. The, the application and all the dependencies and the operating system are still bundled together. So we, we still have that one piece together uh, and, and it, it becomes very, very cumbersome to, to move a VM from um, from one, one hardware to another, from one host to, to the host, because you're bringing up all that, the, uh, the, all that package together with the operating system. So it, it is big uh, kind of uh, bundle to, to uh, to, uh, to to move on from from one host to to another for whatever reason you need to do that maybe you need to do some kind of uh, host uh, maintenance or something like that and you need to uh, to to migrate to to different hosts let alone migrating it to a completely different hypervisor which is uh, which which wouldn't work that's also be a challenge and every time you start a vm you will have to start the operating system first to to boot up. So a little bit later in this uh, in this session, we will see how to resolve that uh, those challenges with uh, with the virtualization with another technology that we're going to talk about. Uh, and then with virtualization, uh, with all those benefits that we get, but we still have, are in the business of um, uh, buying and housing and maintaining the uh, the hardware, the infrastructure. So we are still in the business of guessing how much hardware you will need and uh, when do you need to set it up and uh, you need to uh, to look after it to keep it running and you still have to manage the storage the networking uh, the processing the, the memory and and patching those virtual machines and update their operating system and, and the security patches and and all that uh shebang that comes uh, that comes with it one of the trends today, and it's been for the last few years, is uh, uh, is to go forward to uh, or towards the uh, fully managed services, moving into the cloud, and uh, where do uh, where we do things serverless, where we uh, we we let the cloud provider like Google Cloud manage those uh, overhead, um, like uh, those uh, um, those those maintenance tasks that are repeatable. Let, let Google Cloud do that for us. So if I'm using a database, let's say in SQL. I don't have to maintain the server that runs on it. All I have to do is uh, maintain the data that's on it. And I don't even have to maintain the database. I just put the data into the database um, and, and let all, all, the, um, all the maintenance tasks that comes with it, uh, the underlying infrastructure to, to be done by, by Google Cloud as a managed service. Obviously, I will still have to worry about the security of the database because that's a shared responsibility. I need to decide who do I need to give access to my database? Who I need to give uh, read only? Who do I read 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 write access to my database? But I don't have to worry about the security of the disk, the security of the uh, of the building where the uh, the database is hosted, because Google Cloud takes care of that for us. So that's kind of the direction that uh, a lot of companies have taken, and they're embracing the the cloud technologies. Um, and, and with the, with the, with the benefits that uh, when you are in the cloud comes uh, scaling uh, as as a giving. So um, 
so now uh, with uh, with scaling because we are uh, dealing with a, a cloud provider like Google Cloud who's doing that for you it removes that uh, that need for human interaction when you need to scale up or to to down and this is one of the uh, kind of the um, the attributes or the pillar to be a cloud provider when you 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 have a pooling system where you if you need to uh, to uh, more resources you just tap into that pool of resources that is uh, used by uh, in that multi tenant environment as as a cloud as a, a cloud environment so whenever you need uh, you need uh, you have uh, you have more demand for resources you tap into that pool the cloud provider like google cloud will give you those if you don't need more uh, if after after a while you are um, you are uh, those those resources that are not needed anymore you can just uh, give them back to that pool so basically you, you you with those capabilities and those kind of um, high level tasks that are by, done by the provider gives you the the, the, the ability to focus about, more about developing your application uh, marketing your products getting more insights of your data and let that maintenance jobs to to be done to uh, by by the cloud right and and to be to be quite frank those kind of things like maintenance and patching and taking backups and, and replications in this day and age uh, i would call them thankless jobs i mean no these days nobody will give you uh, credit for taking um, uh, a backup of a database this is uh, this is a normal that you should be it should be it should be done um so it makes sense to um to to abstract that away let the cloud provider do that and you focus on something more innovative and uh, adding value to to business so scaling, scaling on demand. Um, so again, in, in on-premise data center, scalability was like we've seen in the previous example, very, very costly, very, very slow, uh, very difficult to manage. And, and scaling up means, like I said earlier, meaning buying a new servers, buying new hardware, buying disk arrays, uh, networking equipment, and it could have take months before the equipment arrive as we you need to go through that process and uh, it had to be a, a spec created a purchase order signed and then the equipment delivered and, and approved and everything and after the delivering the system like i said earlier you will still need to to unpack the hardware and build uh, uh, kind of the the design system and, and configure it so there's kind of uh, a lot of kind of uh, uh, investment up front which is huge before you get to use that system Virtualization helped us to be more efficient. Uh, so now you have the uh, same hardware, you, you can leverage multiple virtual machines. So you, you basically have it, you, you get in uh, more efficiency in there. So it meant that you could do you could do much more, much quicker, but you still need needed the physical service in place to achieve that. The public cloud, on the other hand, afford us to uh, to ability to step away from the constraints of owning our uh, first of all, our the building, the data center. Uh, um, as we are essentially using um, uh, the, the services that are provided by Google Cloud, so they 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 manage their the data centers and they look after the security of them and all that. So that headache is uh, is taken away from us, and and we can request resources as soon as possible. So it's very very elastic, uh, very very uh, efficient, and very very quick. So as soon as we need those resources. Uh, we expect them to be available pretty much straight away um, and because this is the responsibility of, of Google Cloud. Um, they, they manage all the infrastructure underneath it and we don't have to worry about that. So in practice, how scaling would work? We've got two kinds of scaling. Uh, so we've got what you call vertical scaling and horizontal scaling. So vertical scaling is basically a process of adding more cpu more memory more disk to the same host to the same physical server that we uh, we have or the, uh, the the virtual machines that we are running our uh, applications or our system on um and uh, and with that 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 is not very very practical uh, because each time you say you change cpu and memory you would need to uh, to reboot that machine and uh, configure it with a new spec and and things like that and it, it's got a limit so um, you 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 can uh, you can scale up to to, uh, to a certain a certain limit and uh, from then on you won't be able to do that you won't be able to scale anymore because that's the that's the uh, the, the the physical limit to to the hardware that you are running on horizontal scaling is uh, is easier to to manage automatically uh, because now you're not changing the the specification or the specs of the uh, of the host that running those vms but you are ha having a number of uh, 
of, re of requests of a number of machines that scale horizontally. So basically provisioning service to meet uh, your current load requirements and service basically can be uh, added or removed in what we call manage instance groups that we're gonna we're gonna talk about and this 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 uh, this, uh, this operation is completely automatic so um, it doesn't affect uh, the running state of the application rather it's basically scaling as the demand uh, grows and then we've got two types we've got the manual and we've got automatic so the manual uh, the manual scaling, you would need somebody to uh, to basically action that for you. So uh, you need five more machines, uh, either vertical or uh, we're talking about horizontal here. Um, so you can you can have that human intervention and get somebody to add those machine for you, which is uh, which is okay. But uh, you don't want to be somebody at uh, uh, two o'clock in the morning because your um, your web front applications uh, uh, basically got uh, big demand and you 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 wake up somebody at two o'clock in the morning to to provision more service for you to scale. Automatic is a reaction to current resource consumptions. For example, when you have metrics like vCPU or you have um, uh, the demand on the load balancer, for example, the uh, memory, for example, network ut utilization, disk I/O, for example. So all those metrics, you can set a threshold, and as soon as one of them is uh, is reached or is triggered, it will trigger the process to adding more, more, uh, more, uh, more VMs to this uh, what is called in managed instance group, and we will see how it works in uh, in a second. And even though the physical resources are available on, uh, on kind of on top for us to, to use within Google Cloud data centers. Um, the, the benefits from uh, from how to, to do that is what we have. We have what is called templates. So the templates, in order to have that, uh, to, to be able to uh, to have the capability of auto scaling, we need to to those VMs that we are adding to be based on templates because otherwise the auto scaler that you're going to do he said, okay, you need more CPU, more memory. What VM is going to be choosing? How how's that how's that process is going to be? So that's what templates can, can come into play. So you set up a template, which is basically a specification of a virtual machine saying, if I hit this threshold of that metric CPU or memory or network or uh, load balancer use or, or whatever, that, whatever that might be, then you say, OK, get me uh, another virtual machine based on those specifications in those templates. So that's automatic process is going to create uh, a new VM with a certain specification uh, with memory, disk, uh, uh, CPU, and, and, and any any specific the operating system, uh, the network, uh, and anything like that, and it will add it to the group of uh, of those uh, VMs that you already had in, in that instance group in the group of VMs that you have, and the metric will be calculated again, and it will see if if it's still above the threshold that you specified. If it is then it will add you another vm if that threshold is gone down be below the uh, what you set it, was it off for as an auto scaler trigger then it will not add any other vms uh, and you will have a, a lower threshold as well say okay if my metric is below a particular metric then start removing those vms away from and give them back to the pool so so an instance template is very easy to create uh, on um, on, on the Google console is as if you are creating a new virtual machine. Uh, so you specify the number of vCPUs, you give it a name, the operating system, and all the specification that you would do as if you are creating a VM. And then this template will be the base of what is called the, the managed instance group. So a managed instance group um, lets you operate applications on multiple in the, in identical VMs based on that template, and that's why they are identical, because they are all based on the same template. And you can make all workloads, you can make them um, uh, scalable, highly available, by taking advantage of automated uh, 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 managed instance groups. So uh, the auto scaling, you will have what is auto healing. So if uh, an, uh, one VM um, is not responding, it will, it will, there is a process to, to, uh, to restart it or uh, to take it out from the migration, more from, uh, from the managed instance group and create a new one. And you can have regional, can have multiple uh, multiple zones in, in the region. 
Um, you will have automatic updating for patching for the operating system. So all that will be taken care of uh, for you. And then we will have what is called end managed instance groups. Um, but basically, it will be uh, similar to the managed, but they're not based on the same temp templates. You will have um, uh, different resources, and the load balancer will basically um, uh, uh, balance the load across those resources that you created, uh, different different virtual machines. But in, in, in this case, there is no template. You will have to, to manage that uh, for yourself. You need to add those resources to, to that instance group because unmanaged. managed. And auto-scaling, uh, auto-scaling, as I said, is, uh, is that feature of the managed instance group. Uh, so basically, it's an auto scaler that is based on that template, um, and that auto scaler will add or delete those instances from that managed instance group, based on the uh, on the on the um, on the metrics that we discussed. Either it's going to be CPU, uh, HTTP load balancing, uh, serving capacity, because the instance group is going to be uh, on the back of, um, uh, let's say, you have a front end application, and the load the load balancing will be the the, uh, the instance group will be the back end of that load balancer. So when the uh, request comes to, to your application, they will hit the load balancer and the, the load balancer will route that uh, that traffic to, to the VMs into that uh, managed instance group. And, and you can use any specific metrics. You don't have to be specific on CPU or HTTP load balancing. You can create any um, any metric based on the on the on the natively cloud monitoring tools in in GCP, and you can do a combination of uh, of, uh, of different metrics, and you can base that auto scaling based on that, uh, and basically that auto scaler will continuously will be collecting usage information uh, about those metrics, and as soon as um, that threshold is is past a certain uh, limit that you specified, it will it will trigger the action to um, to either add VMs or uh, or re remove them, so that's what we call an auto scaling policy. Now, this is when it comes to to VMs, to infrastructure as a service. Let's have a look at uh, other managed services in GCP that will allow us to uh, to do auto scaling uh, for us, uh, which is basically super super friendly. So let's go back to the problem that we discussed before, the limit we get with virtualization. So, so with virtualization, when you run multiple applications um, within a single VM, it creates another problem. And that problem is actually uh, the applications that are on, on that VM, uh, they share dependencies. They are not isolated from each other. And the resource requirements of one application uh, the second problem is the, the the resource requirement of one application can can starve other applications of the resources. So one application can be very very kind of uh, uh, memory intensive, CPU intensive. So it will have an impact on the performance of the other application. So when it comes to, for example, uh, upgrading dependencies of one application, it will have an issue breaking the other applications that are on that VM. So uh, so the kind of the VM centric way to solve this problem is to uh, go back to uh, to what we used to do with the physical service. So have each VM dedicated to uh, one application. Now we don't have that issue of um, um, uh, contention for resources, dependencies, um, breaking each other, the applications. And each application in that case maintains its own dependencies. The kernel is isolated, so uh, so one application won't affect the performance of another. And and the result is is clear: is that two complete copies of the kernel will have two operating systems that are separate. And um, if if we're talking about scaling in that case, you have hundreds of those applications. You all of a sudden you will have hundred copies of that kernel of that operating system, and uh, it will. We go back to um, to the issue of wasting resources again. So VMs are also relatively slow to to start up again because you are combining entire operating system. Uh, and imagine you have a uh, front end applications and uh, some some users that are waiting to to purchase some items on your website, and all of a sudden you are creating new VMs. You you will have to wait a minute and a half at least. For the the VMs to be initialized before the application will initialize, and uh, users these days with the competition out there, four or five seconds the application is responding. Basically, the, you you will use the user, and the worst of that, the use that user 
is going to go for a, another competitor that's uh, basically selling the same product that you are doing. So it kind of uh, uh, have a double effect, negative effect on uh, the experience of, uh, of the user. Now, a more efficient way to, uh, to resolve the dependency problem is to, um, is to implement abstraction at the level of the application and its dependencies. So we said earlier that the dependencies, they break uh, each other. So you don't have to, in this case, you don't have to virtualize the entire machine or even the entire operating system, but just the user space. So we want those, um, we want those, those the code, the, the kernel, uh, and uh, the dependencies of the application. We want them to, to, to be together so we can move them, make them portable. Uh, and this this what it means to create containers. So the containers are uh, isolated user spaces for running application application code. So con they are very lightweight, very very portable. They they don't carry um, a full operating system like VMs, and they can be scheduled or or packed tightly into the underlying system. And you can run them. It, it doesn't matter what you have, as long as you've got the the runtime for the uh, that runs the containers, you should be good to to move them uh, anywhere to go. You don't wait for an operating system to start, which make them very very efficient. So the, this level of abstraction is is really great. It's super super useful because you don't have to worry about the the rest of the system. So the the the, um, uh, the idea of containerization is basically the uh, the uh, the next step in the evolution. Of uh, of managing code, and this is why developers they uh, they really love it. Um, so they are efficient, they are they are portable, uh, very very lightweight. They are standalone, they isolated. So you develop application code in the in the usual way, either on your desktop or your laptop or servers. The container allows you to execute your final code anywhere you want. So uh, you don't have to worry about the dependencies anymore. And uh, you just package your code with all dependency it needs, and the engine that on the containers will execute your container, which is responsible to to make them available at uh, at the runtime. So the the, con the container abstraction makes your code very portable. You can treat the operating system and and uh, like you see in the slide, the operating system and the hardware as a black box. And the top of that, you will have your containers, very very portable and uh, very very efficient. And because they are very, very lean, all of a sudden you are likely to, the developers will uh, will love it. It makes their uh, development life cycle very agile. And all of a sudden you will have loads of loads of those containers, each performing their own function. And you are all of a sudden going from monolith into microservices. And, um, and in order to do that, you need to something to manage that container infrastructure for you. So before we were, Worrying about managing the infrastructure of the VMs, uh, the backups, the uh, the security, the patching. Now all of a sudden you have a new ecosystem with uh, maybe hundreds of those containers that you need to uh, to deploy in different hosts and and things like that. And you need an infrastructure to or uh, what we call an orchestrator to take care of that. And this is what Kubernetes is there for. So Kubernetes is an orchestrator which is an open source uh, but helps you orchestrate. Uh, and manage your container infrastructure on premises or in the cloud. So, so the Kubernetes it is uh, moving for virtualization, which which was like a, a VM centric. Now we are container centric managed uh, environment, and the Kubernetes obviously started by uh, uh, many many years ago, started by Google themselves, and uh, basically they made it open source and they donated it to the uh, community. Uh, and, and now it's basically a project of uh, the Vendor Neutral Cloud Native Computing uh, Foundation. Um, and what it helps you to do is automate the deployment, the scaling, the load balancing, and logging, monitoring, everything that you need to um, to manage the orchestrate your containers. Uh, it's done by Kubernetes. But Kubernetes on its own, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's an environment. It's, uh, um, uh, it's an infrastructure itself. So if you are to create a Kubernetes cluster on on uh, on your on-premises, you you will have to have the knowledge. It's a complicated task to uh, to be doing that, and that's why Google has made uh, a fully managed service in GCP called GKE Google Cloud uh, Kubernetes uh, service, which basically takes care of managing the, the Kubernetes environment. So now all of a sudden you don't have to worry about 
creating a master node because the uh, Kubernetes cluster is, um, is a master node, where, what is the brain of Kubernetes, where you have all those services and components that have intelligence to, um, to, uh, to orchestrate containers and uh, your applications into, into those containers. And this is now being taken care uh, for you by, uh, by, uh, by Google Cloud by using uh, uh, GK, which is now a master that is that runs the uh, the control plane, uh, which is the the, the, the the brain of the uh, Kubernetes service. And it is hidden away from us because it's fully managed by Google. And they give you the capabilities to, to create the nodes, uh, the number of nodes of that cluster, depending on uh, how much demand you you uh, you have for uh, for your clusters and and the nodes they are basically VMs uh, the the virtual the virtual machines that host your containers in GKE uh, you call them nodes and if you enable things like GKE auto repair uh, it will repair or uh, unhealthy nodes for you it will do periodic health checks it will do uh, uh, it will do uh, auto scaling like we uh, we're gonna see so this is why we bring in. Uh, this managed service for to talking about scaling so let's let's have a look how how that works so so it's easy in in uh, in kubernetes engine in google kubernetes engine to create a cluster so it's uh, you you either use the console uh, and you select either a default uh, cluster which is a master node which is hidden from us and three nodes or you can you can customize it to whatever number of nodes that you want or you can run just a command uh, g cloud container clusters create and you give it a name and uh everything is is managed for you from from that uh, point on and with kubernetes um the ultimate aim is to deploy your application in the form of uh, obviously containers but uh on on the set of those nodes for for the cluster but but the thing is in in kubernetes um you can't just create a container deploy into the cluster the the smallest um object that you can create it is what is called pods and a pod is just like an abstraction a container of a container so you can put containers into those pods and uh, you might have like uh, two applications that are kind of tightly coupled they have they share the same life cycle the same the same network the same storage you can put them in the same pod and you deploy them into the kubernetes uh, cluster so this is what we call pod and the pod the pod concept is very important because everything is based on there when we talk about scaling in a second. Um, so the complexity of creating the uh, of managing the cluster is taken away for us, and now we we just need to deploy our application into into the nodes. Um, and now we can we can have two types of of scaling when we do with uh, dealing with Kubernetes. Um, so first of all, we, we have what is called uh, replicas. Uh, so a replica is a set of the number of uh, of the those ports that you want to run, so it's like a, a, a controller in, in Kubernetes that will always check the um, the desired state that you want. Say I want uh, uh, ten of those replicas, you will create a deployment, and uh, the deployment is a controller that will always say, okay, I always need to be running those five or ten that you specified. If one of the pods goes down. This control is always checking, and it will basically create another pod to to be always having the number that you specified. You can, uh, if you say with with five, and all of a sudden you said, okay, I want ten now, so it's easy. You just kubectl scale, and uh, you increase the number of replicas of those pods to um, to serve your your uh, your user. And this is like a manual um, process now that what we're doing with the, with the scale command. Uh, you can also auto scale uh, automatically. So uh, similarly, when we looked at the managing instance groups uh, in here in Kubernetes, it's the same concept uh, as the metrics that we used uh, in uh, managing instance groups. So we we base it on the threshold on, uh, for for instance, in this case, CPU. So you specify the number that we uh, the minimum number of pods that we want to run, or the replicas the replicas that we want to run, and the maximum based on that cpu so when the cpu reach uh, that threshold we will have more pods generated so this is from pod perspective that we are doing that the instance group will take care of um, of putting uh, appropriate images on the new machine and starting them and scaling them so so now we're talking about the scaling of the infrastructure of the of the cluster itself not the number of replicas of the pods where the application exists so let's say uh, you have a cluster of three, if three nodes, and you 
you uh, you scale to uh, a big number of pods and uh, obviously each pod will will be using uh, consuming resources from cpu and memory and it comes at the time that the cluster can't handle more pods or more replicas and in that case you will need to to scale your infrastructure that's running kubernetes basically the number of machines that you need to start uh, and in, in here you can see um, G Cloud Compute Instance Group Manager resize the, the Kubernetes node, that is the pool that runs your Kubernetes. You can uh, uh, you can you can scale it manually. Uh, here we are resizing it. To, it was three, we resizing it to five. But also you can do uh, an auto scale, so you can enable auto scaling uh, on the uh, on the cluster itself based again. On, uh, on specification, on, uh, on CPU, on memory, and you can specify the, the minimum number of nodes, the maximum number of nodes, and you, you basically um, uh, enable auto-scaling, and it will be taken care of uh, for you. You don't have uh, to, to do that manually anymore. On top of that, uh, Google have taken another step, so they they gone further. So, uh, so the, the Kubernetes cluster that we looked, this is the standard. So, it's been running for it's been GA for for many years now. Recently, I think about a month ago, uh, a new uh, a new edition of uh, GKE of the Kubernetes cluster called, called Autopilot, same as like you are in. A, a, a pilot, an autopilot mode uh, in an aeroplane. So autopilot is a new mode of operation uh, for creating, managing those Kubernetes cluster in, uh, in in Google Kubernetes engine. So um, what, what happens in this mode is that uh, when you specify this mode, GK will configure and manage the underlying infrastructure for you, uh, including the nodes, uh, the pools that uh, that uh, that create those uh, uh, VMs that are part of that cluster, to only focus. It will basically allow you to only focus on workloads um, and uh, and the deployment of your application. Now, difference between the the other model and this one is uh, you no longer have access to the nodes. It's all managed for you. So uh, it's uh, Google will 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 basically use uh, best practices to create the cluster for you, and you will be paying not per node. You will be paying per pod. So you would be paying per pod resource requests like the CPU, uh, memory, ephemeral storage, and all that per pod level, not at the other node level. So uh, and you, you on top of that you get an SLA on uh, on the host and the control plane, and uh, and you have an SLA on the pods as well, which is uh, super super useful. So with this new addition, then with the autopilot mode, users now can create. Um, uh, you've got two modes. You've got the standard that we talked about earlier. Uh, where users can customize their configuration based on the requirements, and GKE manages the uh, the master node, the control plane, and uses manually provision and manage their their nodes infrastructure. Or the second mode, which is autopilot that we uh, we we talking about here, where GKE manages the nodes, it, it does the pre-configuration for them of the cluster, with basically uh, uh, using Google's production ready best practices baked in so you will have the auto scaling the auto upgrade the maintenance in, is all taken care of so very very uh, useful mode especially if you um, if you if you don't have uh, so much experience to do with gk so i would uh, it's, it's a good idea to start with autopilot if you are if you have like a application centric team uh, and you want them just to focus autopilot is uh, is, is good to start with um, as, as a mode in, in gk in, in google cloud now, what, what if um, you, you you already have containers on on your on prem and um, and you you want to uh, uh, to have a synch synchronized environment uh, between or you are running containers in a different cloud uh, AWS or Azure, uh, but all those clusters that you're creating now it's uh, you, it's it's a burden when it comes to managing different clusters with different admin teams uh, what you would rather have is uh, a hybrid environment either a multi-cloud on-prem and gcp and you want just to everything is synchronized and uh, manage from uh, one control plane for all of them and this is what is provided with the uh, with a product in gcp called anthos um, so this is where your company wants to begin to uh, relocate some workloads away from on-premise and um, you don't want to basically move everything in in one go. Uh, you would want to um, 
to keep some applications, some workloads in, in on-prem and basically move some uh, front-end applications that are um, on-prem to the, to the cloud. So you will have that journey uh, not rushed and uh, uh, less risky. So that's what Anthos allows you to do. So you will have to uh, one control plane that is syncing uh, the two environments or uh, three environments, depending what, uh, what, uh, what workloads have you got, maybe another cloud provider. And we allow you flexibility, scalability, and uh, basically it, it will lower your computing costs offered by cloud services for running those uh, workloads. So uh, this is what, what's beneficial when you run something like, uh, like Anthos. So what you will find is uh, a, a lot of developers, uh, a lot of operators, will find that uh, with this technology of containers and microservices, they will find the clusters are very, very useful. Um, so you will find the loads and loads of clusters being spin up for, for different reasons. And there are different, different use cases. So, and that's why I was saying earlier, when you, um, when we're talking about scale and adding more resources to, to, our, uh, to our stack, not necessarily is it about uh demand for resources only so there are other cases for instance you would want to um uh, you would want a cloud bursting which means that cloud bursting is one of the use cases where you would have your own uh premises uh let's say you have front end and you would know that maybe uh black friday is coming and you have a surge in demand and in order to accommodate that demand you would have to buy a lot of machine on-prem, but it's uh, we, we have seen the process. It takes a long time. It, it, it's costly, and you just need for that burst only for uh, maybe a week or two. So it's just maybe um, those periods in the year when you need that extra power. So what you can do, you can create this hybrid connection, and you can then deploy loads of workloads to kind of like um, go over that spike with the cloud to kind of accommodate that spike and to be able to provide you with that burst of compute that you need just for that period of time and you still have that connectivity that hybrid environment another one is um cross environmental uh, cross environment execution so you have maybe a development and testing in the cloud but you have production in your on-premise so you will have uh, on-premise you'll have um, you might have some legacy dependencies so maybe um maybe you have your front end in the cloud because that's kind of uh, stateless there is no data to to save or anything like that it's okay for us to uh, to do that in the cloud and we can create really a nice deployment where you have a lot of workloads uh, across the globe uh, because that's your 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 footprint that's your uh, basically where you, your user base is across the globe and you can cache things um taking taking capability of uh, of caching of uh, of data that is available for us with uh, things like cloud cdn in gcp closer to your users so the users always closer to your data but maybe some information that you have is to keep on your on premise uh, and so that front end can communicate with that uh, and do that maybe because you have some kind of uh, legal dependencies uh, uh, data sovereignty requirements. So you have to keep all your data. Uh, maybe that is in, uh, let's say, it's in the UAE to 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 be to be staying in the UAE. So we we probably be using uh, uh, the uh, the Qatar uh, data center region that is coming up uh, hopefully in in uh, very very soon. So um, this is kind of uh, one of the capabilities and uh, and use the uh, anything that is uh, front end that is stateless. Doesn't matter if it's in the US or the uh, just to be closer to to use it whatever your use space is, or in some in some form where you, you need to keep your uh, your data for whatever other reason on on premise, uh, and that can be another case scenario for a lot of for uh, those hybrid uh, kind of connection and uh, multi site deployment as well. So uh, to to have that global reach, this is what Anthos will allow you to do with the uh, with the technology of uh, of Kubernetes. Okay, so so this is kind of we talked about the uh, infrastructure as a service, and then we moved on to the different types of uh, Kubernetes uh, and GCP, which is kind of a hybrid. Now we're going to talk about something completely platform as a service. Um, so so we're going a bit closer to the code. So if I'm a developer, I don't care about the infrastructure anymore. Um, I want to make sure that 
all the time I have uh, is um, in, in, in front of me. I have, I have a computer, I have my SDK that I develop on. I don't, I don't want to use virtual machines. I don't care about virtual machines. I, I'm, not, um, I'm not security experts. Uh, I, I don't care about how they scale. Uh, all those kind of things should be automated some, some, in some form or way for me. That's, that's ideally what developer would want. And that's what a platform as a service is. So basically I create code. Sometimes it's um, platform specific, sometimes it's platform agnostic. And I want somebody else to run it for me. Uh, and that is what platform as a service is. So, so in GCP, App Engine is a good example for that. So App Engine, you, you basically create, you, you, you develop your code, and Google runs it for you. So you don't care about what operating system is running. You don't care about how many machines Google run for you. You don't care about the security patches or the scaling or any of those things. Um, and the best part of the platform as a service is that you pay off what you use. So um, so not, not for what you allocate. So if somebody uses your application, you probably don't have to, to pay anything. You, you pay exactly for what is being consumed. The downside is that your code tend to be uh, platform specific. Uh, and the idea that you basically have a lot of limitation with the platform as a service, um, you can't write, for example, with App Engine, especially the, the standard version like the scene, you can't write to local disk. You can't do a lot of things that you can do with virtual machines. So you, that's generally the difference between uh, infra as a service and uh, uh, platform as a service. So we, with infra, we, you, you get the infrastructure, you do, you do uh, whatever you want to do with it. Uh, it's like an IT infrastructure that is you, you manage. It means that you need more uh, specialized uh, people to manage that. You need to understand how to manage system operating systems how to create the architecture to, uh, of, your, to, of, your, of your application, maintain it. Um, on the other hand, platform as a service, uh, you don't care about anything. Google has to take care of, uh, of your, all your code, how to, uh, uh, to run your code. You just focus on business uh, insight, the business logic, um, the actual code that, uh, that you write. And that's what App Engine gives you. So App Engine will scale. And uh, there are two types. We have got the, uh, the the standard mode, and we've got the um, uh, the the, uh, the flexible. So standard is the simpler. It it op it offers you simpler deployment experience than the flexible. Um, you will have finer grained auto scaling. Um, it also offers pre daily usage quota for for the use of services. And what is distinctive about the standard though is that low utilization applications might be run at no charge. If you got like a front end application that is not really big to to consuming anything uh, you you might be able to get away with a free daily quota so you won't be paying anything so the standard environment has got a lot of restrictions it's like a sandbox uh, so you uh, as i said you can't write to local disk and um, uh, a, a lot of lot of constraints that you you have to um, to to be um, to, uh, to satisfy those uh, as part of the requirements of your of your application and that's why there is uh, the second one which is the uh, uh, the flexible so um, maybe you you need to code in different language maybe you need to access to local file systems uh, but you still want to take advantage of the benefits of app engine like uh, automatic scaling up and down and that's what app engine flexible is uh, is for so it's no longer a, um, a sandbox it's a flexible uh, lets you specify the container your application runs in, uh, yeah. So App Engine, it, it, it does run on on uh, on uh, containers. That's the, the the whole idea behind it. And this is kind of a side by side comparison between the two. Um, I, I won't bore you with the details, but uh, basically, in a nutshell, flexible is more flexible. That's why it's called flexible. And the and the the uh, the standard is like a a lot of constraint in there, and. Um, yeah, and it's, uh, it's it's like a sandbox that like you can't do much with it. Uh, so you have to to be very very specific of what you 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 would be using. Cloud Run is uh, is another one. Um, so you can uh, we can think of it as um, when we talked about uh, the autopilot, for example, for uh, Kubernetes. There is another level of. Uh, of running containers, so um, running websites can be difficult with the the the, the uh, all of the overhead of creating and managing VMs, clusters, pods, services. 
And uh, this is fine for, for larger multi-tiered application, but if you are just trying to get your website deployed and visible, it, it's a lot of overhead just to, to run a, a simple application and have to create a cluster and all that uh, shebang that comes with it. With Cloud Run, you have an implementation based on what is called K-native framework. So basically here we take in, we're abstracting away all the infrastructure that runs Kubernetes and you can manage and deploy now these simple websites without any infrastructure overhead um, so you that you experience with the pure uh, Kubernetes cluster. So not only this is simpler approach from um, a management perspective, it also gives you a ability to scale to zero. So if the system is not used, basically you're not paying for anything. So there is no request coming to your website, it will basically uh, scale down to, to zero. If you are having some demand, it will it will be there available and running. So hosting the containerization like internal web applications or cloud run means it's always ready and you are only built when it is used. So very, very flexible. The only thing that you need to be uh, mindful of here is that cloud run only runs stateless containers. And I put double line under that. Uh, if you are dealing with stateful sets and things like that, so cloud run is not uh, is not the way to, to run your containers. So, so it, it is basically a serverless development to containers. It can run either on your uh, GKE cluster or a, a fully managed uh, platform as a service solution provided by by uh, by Cloud Run. So yeah, you've got flexibility in there. Uh, so you, you you've seen that how we we kind of uh, I took you to a journey from infrastructure as a service to uh, a hybrid infra stroke uh, platform as a service talking about Kubernetes cluster and uh, GKE, the autopilot mode, the Anthos, and then we moved on to the serverless, completely serverless with the uh, app engine, uh, standard and app engine uh, flexible mode, and then completely, completely kind of uh, cloud run uh, stateless containers in uh, uh, a K-native uh, framework running uh, stateless uh, containers. Um, I'm just going to check if there's any, uh, any questions um, on the... I can't see any questions. So I'll wait to see if there is any, any question concerning the, um, the topic. Um, can... Okay, let me... I'm going backwards here. Can containers support large size applications? Okay, so we need to um, large size applications is is too vague, so we need to be specific about. But yes, our containers is um, um, when we say when we say large uh, la large size applications, first thing that comes to comes to to mind is we're talking about monolith applications that are big that are running on one application. So this is where you need to to look at um, moving to microservices, and uh, because the the beauty about uh, containers is having that flexibility, making portable. So we, we, we make them small, specific um, applications in, in the in your application stack. So um, so this is the idea. So if you're already having like a monolith application, this is the time that we uh, we we move into the uh, the microservices model and make it smaller. So uh, so yeah so. Uh, that's, that's the idea behind why we use uh, containers in there. Um, by all means, you can ask your questions in Arabic. I will pick that up. I will answer in, in Arabic as well. Um, so uh, don't don't feel that you need to answer to ask in English. Uh, Okay, could you please speak more about VM? So, uh, okay, VM is uh, servers. Uh, I think we, we cover them in, uh, in in the beginning of this session. So is, is there any specifics that you want to, to know about VMs? Like in uh, virtual machines in GCP, they are the compute engine instances uh, service. So basically, uh, any server that is uh, the, the abstraction away of the uh, of the hardware by the hypervisor, and in the in uh, in the very same hardware, you can run multiple uh, multiple servers instead of uh, having one specific hardware running one uh, specific uh, kind of uh, application. Uh, 
Uh, if, if you want more specific, uh, you be more specific about your question, I can. Okay, I'll come back to the last question just to see on top if there is anything. Uh, uh, okay, a certification. I believe this is about the uh, the session. So the team will uh, reach out to you about that. Okay. Okay. Okay, that, that is, uh, I believe there is a session coming up, uh, I believe on, uh, don't call to me on the dates, that is fully Arabic, we, we're going to cover the containers, the Kubernetes uh, in details in Arabic, so uh, watch out for that. So, obviously with Amina uh, Digital Days, we have a, a mixture of uh, English, uh, even uh, Derja in some countries, Arabic, uh, so we can cover uh, be able to cover everyone but by, by all means ask your questions in Arabic I'm happy to to take that so there's another question does it need a background in programming if yes which uh, which language not not necessarily uh, in order to understand Kubernetes but um, if you if you look at docker docker is the, the starting point to um, to develop in uh, developing uh, containerized application so um, uh, let me just maybe put that in the chat. Docker. I can't type in, so I'll ask the team to. That would be your starting point there. But not necessarily, you, you don't have to be a programmer. Uh, so if your application is already containerized, you can use Kubernetes, but uh, Docker, if you want to. To, to start working with containers, um, Docker is the place to start. Okay, I think this is all what uh, I can see from uh, from questions. Um, yes, thank you, thank you, team. We already put the uh, the link in there. Okay, th thank you very much. I think we just uh, hit the hour for this session or thereabouts. Uh, thank you very much for the uh, GTG Mina team to uh, to host me, to have me as uh, today. Uh, it's been a pleasure. Hopefully we'll see you again in, in future sessions. Uh, uh, I would like to know how can you contact some from the sales team? So with him packages, customers. Uh, Okay, uh, we, we, we are a community here. So GDG is uh, a community platform where we, we're not a company that we are selling. So everybody here is uh, uh, basically have passion to, to share knowledge with, with the community. If you want something more specific about any services, uh, I can probably uh, point you to the right direction. So if the team, can you put my, um, uh, maybe my LinkedIn, uh or my um twitter my twitter uh handle by all means you can reach out for any of those uh, questions i'm happy to to help you in there yeah sure so the, the team will share my my contacts in there uh yeah but uh for for um i think coming up the uh in, in the program is uh, there is a, a full session in Arabic by another GDE, very, very good GDE um, specializing containers. So watch out for that session, really, really beneficial. I, I, I already took that, uh, that question about background in programming. So um, the, the good starting point is Docker. So we look at that to get started. Um, from Kubernetes perspective, managed service in GCP, look at uh, GKE. So maybe I could share that. Let me, um, GKE. Okay. And it will take you through a quick start to, uh, okay. 
Can you share that? Yeah, I'm gonna share the other ones as well. App Engine, Cloud Run. There are other services in GCP that um, uh, basically give us the um, capabilities of scaling things like uh, uh, DataProc, for example, which is a Hadoop uh, managed service. Also, you can take the same concept as managed instance groups. And depending on the load on the specific metrics, it will scale for you to run your clusters as well. So, um, yeah, so that's another one. That's Cloud Run. Um, Engine. Okay. App Engine platform. That's another useful one. And uh, watch out for. Um, obviously, I am an organizer, and uh, for the uh, a, a GDG group, the GDG. Uh, you can see a GDG Cloud Emirates. So we will be having what is called study jams where we're going to cover hands-on practicals and labs that we, we go through this uh, these topics hands-on. So we provide you with a, a lab environment where you will practice all these technologies that uh, and those services that we are talking about. So uh, GDG Cloud Emirates, uh, let me share the link in there as well. And register so you can get an update of the uh, events that we are doing. Um, Obviously, practical, we can't have it on YouTube because you will have a need to access to, to an environment and have it, have it more more uh, interactive with the, with the instructor who's doing the, uh, the study jams. So let me share that. So this is the GTG Cloud Emirates. Please uh, go there and, and register and um, you will get uh, updates to the, uh, to the study jams and uh, any specific events that we do uh, around uh, Google Cloud. Let me see if there's any other questions. Okay, so Cup Engine. Let me add the uh, uh, data prop, which we didn't get a chance to talk about in, uh, today, but uh, it's uh, another one that uh, will be super useful. Data prop, Hadoop, which is Hadoop. If you're familiar with Hadoop, it is a Hadoop uh, managed service. Uh, Completely open source, you can bring your, your loads and uh, your workloads and run them straight away. So you, you're not locked into um, to, uh, to anything. Okay, so it's, it's Google developers all about building good things together. So this is why we are a community. So um, yeah, so join us uh, in those events that we are doing with the digital days in, in this Ramadan and, and outside of Ramadan. We'll be running them across all the year. And uh, obviously in the um, our GDG group in uh, uh, Cloud Emirates, uh, exciting times that are happening. Uh, so uh, it's very, very important because uh, Google Cloud is, is basically growing at a, a scary pace, I would say, in the region. Um, Google are investing very heavily in the region. There is uh, new data centers opening in, in Qatar, in uh, in Saudi. So uh, there would be a big demand for the skills in the area of Google Cloud. So take advantage of uh, of what the community is providing for you and um, and all the best. And, and thanks again for, uh, for the team of uh, having me today. Inshallah, we'll see you in future sessions. Thanks again. Assalamu alaikum.